Hello, everybody. My name is Aida Dargahi. I'm the director of Humanities Lecture Series at Foothill College, and uh, I'm a professor of humanities at Foothill College as well. So, dear estimate guests and fellow enthusiasts of the humanities, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Humanities Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us on this special journey. Today, we embark on a captivating journey through the vast realm of human expression, culture, and knowledge. This series is a celebration of the diverse pastiche of human experience designed to ignite our curiosity, challenge our perspectives, and deepen our understandings of the world we inhabit. Over the course of this series, we have assembled an exceptional lineup of distinguished scholars, renowned experts, and captivating speakers. They will guide us through an ex uh, exploration of pivotal historical moments, e examining the profound thoughts of great thinkers, unveil the hidden meanings within artistic masterpieces, and shed light on the complex social and cultural dynamics that shape our world. The Humanities Lecture Series offers a remarkable opportunity to embark on an intellectual odyssey alongside scholars and lifelong learners. Thank you for joining us on this extraordinary journey. Get ready to be captivated, inspired, and transformed as we embark on the Humanities Lecture Series, where the power of the human mind and the spirit will be illuminated like never before. Tonight, we are going to have a 30 to 40 minutes of lecture by our uh, speaker and uh, followed by a Q&A for the rest of the hour. And because uh, given the size of the audience, please mute your microphones and uh, type your comments and questions in the chat box. And one more um, housekeeping note, for those students who are here to uh, earn extra credit, I will ask you at the end of the, um, uh, at the end of the lecture, to type your names, your uh, professor name, and um, your class in the chat box so you can earn credit for this, uh, for the attendance. So now we have a dynamic speaker tonight, and it's my honor to introduce her to you, Dr. Jasmine Darznik. Dr. Jasmine Darznik, Darznik is, a, is New York Times best-selling author of three books, The Bohemians, Song of a Captive Bird, and The Good Daughter, A Memoir of My Mother's Hidden Life. Her books have been published in 18 countries, and her essays have appeared in New York Times, Washington Post, and Los Angeles Times, among others. She was born in Iran and moved to America when she was five years old. She holds an MFA in fiction from Bennington College, a JD from University of California, and a PhD in English uh, from Princeton University. She is an associate professor and chair of the MFA program in writing in California College of Arts in San Francisco. Now, without further ado, here, Jasmine Darznik, please. Hello, everybody. How delightful to be here with you. I um, am going to hopefully live up to this amazing introduction. I was, I felt my heart palpitating just thinking about the gift of the humanities and how 
fortunate we have we are to have series like this where we can gather and share ideas. I mean, it is um, such an essential part of our lives, I think, to be in dialogue with one another. So I'm delighted to be here. I am, first of all, going to express my appreciation to the lovely introducer here, um, Professor Aida Dagohi, who I met not so long ago and um, is the director of the Humanities Lecture Series and extend the, this invitation to me. Um, I am going to plumb two great mysteries today, <laughs> uh, hopefully well and engagingly. Um, the two mysteries that preoccupy me in my life, I mean, two of the greatest ones are why we write and how we endeavor to write. So why would we even want to write and how do we go about it um, once we do find ourselves seized by the desire or the urge or the necessity of writing. So I'm going to offer myself up as an example. If I have writers in the room, hopefully I'll extract a bit, um, a few lessons from my experiences as a writer. But I'm also going to tell you about who I am, because to me, it's impossible for me to talk about my writing without talking about my family, the place I come from, and in particular, the women in my life. So I'm going to share my screen um, and show you some photographs. I, I went um, searching through my family album earlier today, which was lots of fun. And, uh, and so I'm going to share the results of that with you, along with some other images that will hopefully bring to life the stories that I'm about to tell. So. Thank you. Bear with me for a moment. Um, And Aida John, can you just tell me um, if you see the first image, black and white image of? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So this is where it begins, or it's impossible really to to know where to begin your story. I think that's always a challenge for us when we're thinking about our lives: is how far back to go. But for me, this moment that you're seeing here, this moment of chaos, conflagration in the streets of Tehran in the late 70s. They're my moment of origin in a lot of ways. Um, this moment in time, this place, in a sense, birthed me. Um, and it is a moment that I return to often when I think about my writing. Iran at this time in the late 70s was a country on the edge of political upheaval. Soon there'd be gunfire and tanks and dead bodies heaped in the streets. Here you already see the calamity that had befallen the country. In 1978, which is when my family first began to think of immigrating, no one knew it was a revolution. They just called it something called the shuluri, which means kind of the chaos. But there were people, um, my mother who always like she always calls herself a seer. She thinks there's something prophetic about her dreams. Um, she dreamt it. She dreamt there was going to be a revolution. She was not the only one though. I think that she was just someone who was really attuned to the atmosphere of the country in those moments. And so she decided that we were going to leave the country against my father's protests actually, um, decided that we were going to leave the country. Like the hundreds of thousands of other Iranians that left Iran in the late 70s, my family left in a hurry. Um, we didn't know if we would be away for a year or, or two years or a lifetime. Everything was uncertain in that moment. Every year when I was growing up, so the, the, the refrain was, next year we'll go back to Iran, next year. That was said, and it's been said for over 40 years now. Suffice it to say, we never went back. The country never resumed the kind of um, the peace that my family at least was seeking. And so we never went back. I remember though the night that we left Iran, I remember my grandmother sitting me on her lap and, and playing with me. And my mother kept saying to her, don't worry, we'll be back, we'll be back. And my grandmother, I think she sensed that this wasn't true, which is, is what in fact happened. Um, 
so we never we never went back but that moment um that night that we left is just seared in my mind and it's a moment of uncertainty but it's also a moment of love i always think Think of my grandmother's um, just her tenderness and her kindness in in those moments before we were leaving, and how um, how much my idea of Iran would be forever entwined with my love for her. So when I was growing up um, in uh, in Northern California, we never went back to Iran, but I think in a way Iran followed us. It came with us um, to America. It came to, It came with us in the form of our family's life, in the rituals, in the storytelling, in the gatherings that my family would have with other immigrant families in the community. And I grew up, a lot of times I think, more Iranian than I might have been if I stayed in Iran. There's something that happens to immigrants when they, some immigrants, when they come to America, which is that there's this kind of battening down the hatches uh, a, a feeling like we need to stay close, we need to keep things tight, we need to stay bonded to our home or there'll be nothing there. Um, it's a very common uh, feeling I think that immigrants have and my family definitely had it. I loved a lot about um, growing up Iranian but it was also very complicated <laughs> to grow up Iranian to, to, you know, to put it lightly. Um, one kind of one area of complexity was my great love of writing and my love, especially uh, um, not yet, it wasn't complicated to love reading as much as I did, but once I wanted to become a writer myself, that really went up against my family's ideas of what I ought to do. But when I was a little girl, um, heaven to me was going to the public library. I grew up in Northern California and I would come out of the library with books up to like here, you know, <laughs> maybe like over my head. I mean, it seems like mad, it seemed like magic and it still seems like magic to me that you could go into this wonderful place and, you know, come up, come out with all these books and books were wonderful, but they were also an escape. So they were a way that I think that I protected myself in moments of, uncertainty in moments of feeling like I wasn't fitting in, which was a lot of the time when I was growing up. So I was a real reader um, from, from the time I immigrated to the US. Um, my parents ran a motel, let me change the image here. Um, my parents, excuse me, ran a motel. And if you see, these are the pictures that I pulled from our family albums day. But um, on the bottom here, there's an image. This building is still there. Um, it was my parents' 20 room motel on the side of the freeway in Marin County. And this was, um, this was our, this in a lot of ways, this was my home. We had a home, um, you know, in town, but I spent many, many hours of my childhood in this motel, a really kind of rough and tumble place. It was not, um, it was nothing, it, I mean, it was not, not, it wasn't just nothing fancy, it was rather modest and a little bit sketchy and scary for a kid. Um, but, uh, but it was a place that my mother ran. I mean, she was, she was the person who sat at the front desk, she cleaned the room, she ran the whole thing. I mean, from the time I was little, I was a witness to her extraordinary work ethic, her courage. I mean, she came to America when she was, she was in her, maybe she was 40 years old, um, which is amazing when I think about it, that she was coming with very little English, I mean, very little education, but she was able through the force of her personality uh, and her hard work ethic to support us by, by running the motel. So just a few other shots of us. These are kind of when we were newly arrived in America, um, the one on, there's, a, there's an image there of me and my grandmother and my mother on one of the ferries, you see the Golden Gate Bridge behind us. Um, and I think San Francisco was to them, when they were in Iran, it was the beacon of uh, freedom. You know, I think that the reports of San Francisco in the 70s had reached them and they really thought of San Francisco as a place of freedom and liberation. And I don't think that you could have, it to an Iranian, you couldn't have moved further away from Iran without falling off the planet than moving to California is the way I think about it. You know, it was as far as you could get from the Islamic Republic of um, Iran um, as one could possibly get, I think, in those days. <clears throat> so um, I was a voracious reader, as I just let you know, um, but 
in my family, education had one purpose, and that was to support you. You were to study something that would lead to earning, <laughs> earning a good living. And there were only two courses. You either went to medical school or you went to law school. This also, I think, is a really typical story for immigrants. There was no alternative. For girls, you could get married. That was maybe a third route. But for me, there was a great amount of pressure. There was a lot of pressure to go and to study something practical. So when I decided, I actually did do that. <laughs> I went to law school. Um, but when I decided to get a PhD in English, it was shocking. I mean, my mother was she was infuriated by this decision. Um, you know, sometimes people think, oh, she must have been so proud, but she really wasn't. I mean, she thought I was really um, throwing away my life <laughs> in a certain way. To her, um, you know, doing something as flighty as becoming a scholar or a writer was um, really went against what she thought we had come here for, you know. So there wasn't a lot of support in that. Um, and uh, and yeah, I did it. I mean, that was the first, I think, real bid for freedom that I that I um, made in my own life. The first the first time that I really acted on my own counsel, because I grew up in a really traditional Iranian Muslim family, and there wasn't a lot of support um, to make decisions on your own. So going away to graduate school, reading works like Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior. And if you haven't read it, re read everything I'm telling you about, <laughs> make notes and, and definitely read these books. They were transformative for me. Books like Dust Tracks on the Road, which is a memoir by the great, um, Zora Neale Hurston. As I was reading books like this in graduate school, I was struck not just by the beauty of the works that I was reading about, but this feeling like these women were telling me the truth about their lives. And that was not something I was accustomed to. Women in my family, in my community, I think, in my culture, when they tell the truth, they tell it in whispers, if at all. And so to see these works of literature, which is as a public a gesture, you know, as you can as you can make, to tell the truth in this incredibly public way was a revelation to me. It was it it was it was just it changed everything. I think psychologically, intellectually, on so many registers. So um, I was reading and um, studying literature. And eventually, at, at a certain point, I realized I was um, reading stories of Iranian immigrant writers, and a lot of the stories were extraordinary, but I noticed there were a lot of silences and absences in these stories. Um, certain things that I knew happened, that had happened in my family, were given scant attention. So, for example, my gra grandmother, Cobra, who you see here on the um, on the top right of this. Um, my grandmother Cobra was divorced. She was a survivor of domestic abuse. She, um, she, she had an extraordinary life, but so many experiences that she lived through were not, I didn't, I just couldn't find them in literature. And likewise, my mother's story. So when I was in my mid twenties, I found out that my mother had been married before she married my father. This was a secret she had kept from me all of her life. And it was, um, it was one of those moments where, <laughs> you know, that also was a before and after moment where I really, I recognized the, so much that I didn't understand about my mother and about Iran. And so when I began surveying the literature and, and beginning to think about what I what the stories I might want to tell, it was my grandmother's and my mother's stories that I that I decided to write. Take it. Okay, so this is the first book. Um, it is a novel, uh, excuse me, it's a memoir about um, about my mother's life. It's about her having been married when she was 13 and then divorced when she was about 15 years old. My mother gave up a child. She is the good daughter of the title. I'm not the good daughter. Um, it is the story of the surrender of that child and, and the aftermath of this totally traumatic experience in my mother's life. This is a story, like I say, that she had, she'd kept secret from me, but also secret from 
anyone she knew in America. <clears throat> Okay, and this is an image, this is a photograph that I, that I came up, that my mother gave me as we were working on The Good Daughter together. So the process of writing that book was really like an oral history project. It was the first time I had sat with my mother for so long with as much patience as I could muster because the story that she was telling me was one that I couldn't have made up on my own. I had to go to her. I mean, it was very important to me that it be authentic as authentic as I could make it. And there were parts of it that I was learning it, learning as I was writing the book. Um, so the details of this, this, you know, young woman with this baby and what it felt like to be a divorcee in mid-century Iran, all of this was, I was learning in real time as I was writing The Good Daughter. This is my second book. Um, when I finished The Good Daughter, I realized I wasn't done with Iran or Iran wasn't done with me. And I decided to uh, write about a woman who is notorious, infamous, extremely well-known in Iran, but not known at all uh, to Americans or in general in the West. So this is a poet. Her name is Furuk Farouk Saad. When my mother, um, father and I came to America, we brought two suitcases and there was very little that my mother had time or, you know, that, that she was able to, to bring with her to America. But one thing she brought was a book of poems by Furu Farabsad. And I think that tells you something about the stature of this woman. For women like my mother, who were becoming independent and modern in the 60s and 70s, Furuk, this woman, you see her half, half of her face, was a legend. She was an she, she is a real um, inspiration now to generations of Iranians. So I was really interested in telling her life story the best I could. And I decided to tell it in fiction. And this is um, on the right here. You see the, I, I, I'm showing you this mostly because I love um, what the publisher did here and taking that half profile. Um, sometimes the publishers disappoint you, but they didn't <laughs> with this cover. I really, I really like this kind of evocation of Furuk's um, image there. And I like it because even though it's fiction, it's very much rooted in truth. The reason it's written in fiction though is because I believe very strongly there are some stories that maybe you can only tell in a true way through fiction. So Furuk's story, Song of a Captive Bird, Furuk was born in 1935. So she's roughly my mother's age. I had read a lot about her as I was growing up, um, or excuse me, as a, um, in, in, in college especially, I read her poems for the first time. This is just um, her handwritten, a, a sheaf of her handwritten draft of a poem. Um, and she, she told me so much about what it meant to be a woman in Iranian culture. She taught me about what it means to be truthful, to be honest. In, um, in a world that really conspires against women telling the truth about their lives. Um, she was somebody who, around whom a lot of legends and myths have accrued. So writing a novel about her was this wonderful opportunity to kind of like, to, to, to excavate and to go deeper and beyond some of these myths and get at her um, in a way that, that made me know her and that might make other people know her. Um, after the 1979 revolution, by the way, so why is Furuk, I ought to tell you why Furuk is so inspiring and extraordinary. She was writing about issues that are still landmines, I think for women writing, for anybody writing really. So she was writing about sexuality. She was writing about political persecution. She was writing about environmental um, degradation. She was writing about issues that are still, I think, provocative, and she was doing it in mid-century Iran, um, and she was paying the price for it, too. Um, in After the 1979 revolution, she was always really controversial during her lifetime, but after the revolution, her poems were banned. Um, when one publisher refused, when one publisher was told they had to stop publishing her poems, 
um, and they refused, the publishing house was actually burned to the ground. So you get a sense that by that point, she had been dead over a decade, but she was that much of a threat. She is still that much of a threat um, to the theocracy as it's practiced in Iran, that her poems are forbidden from, uh, from view. And the cost for this publisher was actually the decimation of the publishing house. So there's lots about Furul that I had to imagine I couldn't ever know for sure, but that's actually how I really enjoy working. Um, I love these, these um, interstitial, these kind of, these places in between the truth and imagination. So there's a beautiful line, I think, uh, when Captive Bread and then my next novel, in E.L. Dr. who once said, happen, but the novelist will tell you what it felt like for that thing to happen. So with a novel, with fiction, you can go into the interior space of someone decades gone, someone decades dead, like Furuk. No historian would do such a thing. Um, that's a leap, a, um, a, a, a kind of daring that I think only novelists embark on. So not so in writing about Furuk, I was letting myself explore a lot. And as much as I felt that I needed to be truthful to what I did know, I let myself imagine a lot about what I couldn't know, about what I couldn't know. Um, Song of a Captive Bird is the story of a woman coming to her own power in a culture that seeks to silence and diminish her at every turn. Um, I think it's complicated. It, to put it mildly, to write about Iranian women in America, because there are so many narr narratives that would tell you that we are um, we are we are weak, and we are silent, and we are hidden. And I don't want to suggest that those things haven't been the aspiration of the regime, or or ha haven't been enabled by the culture. I think that those things absolutely are true, but. In writing about women like Furuk or about my mother, it's always very important to me that I show that women's power in responding to the circumstances of their life is no less worthy of attention. So the stress isn't on suppression. Suppression is there. Domestic violence is there. The abuse is there. The, um, the regime is there. It's always there, but the women are not suffering silently in the face of all of these factors. Um, I read stories and I, I read the, I, excuse me, I write the kind of stories that I want to read myself. I, re, I want to read stories that teach me how to survive. And those are the kind of stories that I try to write as a novelist or as a memoirist or as a nonfiction writer, because it's not just about self-expression or, um, or exploration. It is about how to survive, how to transcend, how to become stronger. I think stories are such an important vehicle for us to fortify ourselves. And so I'm always writing with this desire um, to give people the kind of stories that might help them endure or give voice to or understand better the circumstances of their own lives. Um, now I'm gonna break out of this for a moment and just read to you a little bit um, from Song of a Captive Bird. Aida, can you shake your head if that's all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, sure, please. Wonderful. Um, so just to give you a little taste of, or a little um, listen to what, what is this sound like? I'll, I've talked about why I write and how I write, but how does it actually sound when I bring all of this to the page? So this is from Song of a Captive Bird. And um, it is, we're, I'll just tell you, we're in the late uh, 60s in Iran. This is Furuk's voice. When I left my father and then my husband, I lost my name and I was no one. But there was a freedom in this to be a woman on my own. It made me strong and it made me the poet I wanted to be. I knew so many poets whose lives had nothing to do with their poetry. They were only poets when they sat down to write. 
They'd finish a poem and then turn back into the greedy, short-sighted, miserable, envious person they were before they wrote. Well, I could never believe in their poems because I couldn't believe in them. When I was alive, poetry was the answer I gave to my life. I didn't search for anything in my poems. I wrote to discover myself and to become myself. And I believed in being a poet in all moments because to me, being a poet meant being fully human. I tried to write and live with courage and also to die that way, bravely, honestly. There's nothing for you in Iran anymore, Darius had once told me. For days afterward, I turned his words over in my mind. I wondered what it would be like to live in a place where a woman's life was less governed by shame and prohibition, a place where I could walk with my eyes straight on the horizon, a place where I could be free. I thought hard about leaving Iran, but if Darius, Darius could fully choose a life with me, if he stayed married to his wife, what did it matter if we went, if we left Iran or went abroad? But there was more to my decision not to leave the country. For so many years, I wished I had been born somewhere else. I felt that my life had been wasted in Iran, but the truth was I loved it. I loved Tehran's relentless sun and heavy dusks and dusty side streets. I loved sleeping on the rooftop on summer nights and waking to the morning's call to prayer. When I walked in the streets, there was a memory at every turn, a rootedness I felt in my limbs and my heart. Whatever Iran wanted to be, I loved it. I had found my life's purpose here. Every poem I'd ever written was entangled with my country's stories. I loved its downtrodden, small-minded, generous people. I loved them and I belonged to them. They were my people and I was theirs. So I'm gonna stop sharing, um, Buruk at least. All right, and how do we get from Buruk in mid-century Iran to this woman who may be known to many of you. This is uh, Dorothea Lang, the American photographer. Well, I finished up, you know, I, I, I I finished up these two books about Iran and I felt not that Iran was done with me because I don't think it is and I don't think it ever will be, but that I wanted to explore something else, um, that I wanted to look closer to home and tell a story that, um, that, was, uh, that was maybe more recognizable to, uh, to an American readership. So, I began researching the life of this woman, um, another icon, the photographer Dorothea Lane. Um, she's known really mostly for her photography during the depression. This is probably one of not just her, one, one of her best known images, but one of the most famous photographs ever taken. It certainly circulated a lot. This is a picture she took called Migrant Mother. Um, she took it in 1936. Sorry about that. Um, in 1936 during the height of the depression and it's really come to stand for a whole era. Um, <clears throat> when I was um, exploring Dorothea Lange's life, so Lange came to San Francisco as a young woman. I grew up in the Bay Area so it, in a sense it was natural to to want to tell a story about this place. Um, and she came to San Francisco in the um, in the early 20s. And that part of her, this part of her life is a lot less known. And again, for a novelist, I mean, you're really, you really the most exciting things happen when you can't find anything, when you can't find a particular story. So with the good daughter, it was that I felt stories like my mother's and grandmother's weren't being told. With Furul's story, here's this ex extraordinary Iranian woman that no American has ever heard about. Let's go do it. Um, and in writing about Lang, I got especially excited about this period of her life, 1920 San Francisco, about which people m know much less than her work in her um, her life during the Depression. So Dorothea Lang um, ran a studio at um, in San Francisco at 540 Sutter Street. This is a brochure to that um, to that studio, and it's it's really jarring, I think, to some people to know that this woman who became um, a voice for so many 
dispossessed people at one time catered to the wealthiest of clients. So she was, when she was working in San Francisco during the twenties, she was um, working with the creme de la creme of society. So the, 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 real, um, the real power players in San Francisco were coming to her. All very interesting, but I don't think I would have gotten involved with Dorothea Lane had it not been for a mention of her Chinese American assistant. And I'm almost, I'm nearly to the end of my talk. So, um, <laughs> so I'm almost there. Um, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation. So Dorothea Lang had a Chinese American assistant and that alone was fascinating to me. How had these two women found each other? It would not have been an orthodox, um, a, a customary decision for a white woman to choose a Chinese assistant to work alongside her at this time in history. These are real campaign um, campaign posters, just to give you a sense of how divided and how noxious and how um, how really um, poisonous the atmosphere was in San Francisco at this time in the 1920s. Um, this is a real campaign. This is a character in Bohemians, eventually the novel I wrote, um, a senator who runs on a campaign promise to keep California white. Um, San Francisco is a divided city. It is um, a city in which the Chinese live in abysmal um, circumstances and in which their lives are really silent and unseen by others. Um, and so knowing that Lang had worked with a Chinese American assistant gave me an opportunity to go deeper into that history, which is something I, I was talking earlier about how I was learning so much of my mother's story as I was writing um, my first book. I was learning so much about California as I was writing um, this novel. And that's one of the gifts, I think, you know, for a novelist is it's an opportunity for you to deepen your understanding, to follow your curiosity, but to also be humbled by all that you don't know. Um, I've certainly been humbled a lot. Uh, so I'm going to break out of... Um, out of uh, this mode and just kind of pop, um, pop over here to finish things up. Um, I have lots of theories about fiction, where it comes from, what to do with it. But the, the idea that I really wanna end with and share with you is that I believe that fiction and literature are their most powerful when the writer puts herself in service to something greater than her own story. Um, and this is, if I'm ever missing anything, you know, I, I teach creative writing and I encounter a lot of good writing, but I think the thing that is sometimes or often absent is a feeling that the writer has really surrendered herself to something bigger or that he has surrendered or they have surrendered themselves to something that is bigger than just the desire to express themselves, right? And this probably has a lot to do with being Iranian and coming from a culture in a country where the stakes are very high. To speak the truth, to write in Iran is an extraordinary risk. Um, and so that specter, that risk um, is, I think, forever with me, or I can't not think of that. And so I try to write in a way it's hard and I, I don't even know, I feel a little bit embarrassed to even, you know, say that I try to do this, but I really do try to put myself in service that's, to something that's beyond me, whether it's my, the women of my family and the truths that they had to suppress for so long, or the shameful episode in American history that far too many people don't know. Um, these things, I think, in the end, are what makes me most excited about writing. And to the extent that I could imagine my work enduring, I think it's because this feeling of servitude is very deeply entrenched in me as a writer. So with that noble thought, I will finish up and, um, and I would love to converse with Aida and any of you, if you um, have particular questions, happy to, to speak with you all. Wow, thank you. Was so captivating, <laughs> so much, yeah, deep, deep. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, audience, our guests, uh, please, if you have any question, if you think it's hard to type, you can just unmute your uh, microphone and ask the question, please. 
Okay. Falk, please. Thank you uh, so much for your talk, Jasmine. That was uh, so wonderful. Uh, you took us on such an incredible journey. Um, my question I have for you is you talk about um, moments of crisis in history and, and how do you see uh, you know, the function of literature in, in deepening our understanding of um, how to come to terms with trauma um, not individually, but as a country or as a particular group of people? There is so much embedded in that question. I feel like we could spend hours talking about this. Um, I really believe that literature is the memory of humanity. That is how I think about it. And I think that we in individually and as cultures and communities often turn away from our memory. We cannot we cannot encounter it in the moment, right? I think that this is a function of trauma is that when shuts down, you know, that that it becomes um, really difficult to look, look back or to make sense that all the focus becomes on survival. You know, um, I've just in thinking about my mother's life, you know, it took her 40 years until she could reach that moment where she could look back and encounter her own memories, yeah. And I think as people, as, as cultures and communities, we have similar, we have crises, we have traumas, and then we have moments of reckoning or opportunities for reckoning. I think most people also are more amenable or open to encountering harsh truths to, through story than they are through nonfiction. Well, nonfiction is story too, but I think there's something disarming about fiction. Um, there's something, I think all of us never quite lose that little child who just wants to be told a story. It's an innocent part of us and it makes us it permeable in a sense, right? Whereas I think with nonfiction, sometimes I doubt, I doubt that many people would have written, would have, excuse me, read a book about, a nonfiction book about this Iranian poet or, you know, or a treatise on, I mean, these stories are out there. The stories that I'm telling in Bohemians about Dorothea Lang and San Francisco and the Chinese Americans, those have been out there a long time, but I think fiction and literature create this space to hold those stories and we are more receptive to them in that form than we might be in other places, in other ways. So that's just a few, kind of scattered thoughts about that um and that's you know why i think to drill down a little bit more is i think that's why the humanities are so precious and that why, why we should be fighting so hard um not to just see them survive but flourish because if we lose that we lose our memory as people on this planet yeah so thank you pan uh, you had your hands up yeah, it was sort of unintentionally answered. Um, but <laughs> my question was originally, yeah, during your presentation, you had mentioned that there are some stories you can only write through fiction. And so my question was, like, what stories can you only write through fiction and why? And I think you sort of touched upon that, but um, sure. yeah. Ooh. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. And I'll, I happily will try to clarify. Um, there are especially, I think, there, there are some stories that I think are particular rife for this kind of approach. And I think for me, they're stories that have to do with women or people of color, um, because these are people who have not counted as important in the historical record. You know, um, I think they have, there has been so much refusal to incorporate these stories or even to gather them in the first place. And I think it is work that, the historians work very, they endeavor so hard to capture what they can of these stories, you know? Um, and my work definitely builds on that. But by the time, sometimes by the time the historian gets there, it's impossible, you can't capture it. So in the, in the case of Bohemians, there's a Chinese American assistant. No one ever thought to ask her story, even, even just even to ask about her relationship to Ling. I mean, not to mention to ask her who she was or where she came from or, or the circumstances of her life. But in all of these years, no, in all the years um, 
that have transpired. And now we are at a point at which that is not salvageable. That person is gone. Now there's a lot of there's a lot of information you can use to guess who she might have been, but you'll never conclusively get it in nonfiction, or you probably won't, right? And so fiction in this case was an opportunity to tell the story that history couldn't tell. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's um, you know, there there are certain stories that are like I say, just more, they're, they're, it's more necessary even, you know, not even that there's an opportunity, but the, the feeling I, I find when I was looking at Lang's life that it was necessary to tell the story because you can't understand her without, um, without some kind of approximate guess of who this woman was in her life. So, um, so those are the kinds of instances where I think fiction can tell that story better. Um, another example I'll give, which is, I have not done this, but I think sometimes people just simply can't write their own stories as memoir and they have good reason. Their parents are still alive. <laughs> you know, that the, there's, there's, it's so complicated to write about your family. Um, and I think in that case, there's an opportunity where I think fiction might be the only way that you can tell that story, right? And I think um, so much better to have it in a fictional, fictional version than to wait you know, how many years, if ever, and get to write that story as nonfiction. So that's another instance I can think of. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah, somebody asked, how difficult was it to gather research for you, uh, for your later two books? I think the two book books. and The Bohemians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with Song of a Captive Bird, I'm writing about an Iranian poet and so much material just did not exist. Um, a lot of her papers were destroyed. The regime itself has sought to erase her from <laughs> the history of Iran. I, as I said, her books are um, prohibited. People do still get them um, on the black market. But I mean, here, here was somebody about whom, you know, whatever, there, whatever had once ex existed had been extinguished. It had been eradicated. And, um, and so I, I had no choice. There was a lot I had to make up. And in that case, I used something that was, because Furu wrote so much um, autobiographically, I was able to use her poems in a census source material. So the poems survived and the poems told me stories and the poems showed me the way. Um, so that was one really important source material I was able to find. Uh, and then you read everything you can, anything that's adjacent, anything that's, um, you know, any anything. I mean, I had, um, you know, I had read for a long time. I read every history, every um, every nonfiction account I could of Iranian women writers during this period, Iranian history. You know, um, I, I fully steeped myself. But there came a point where only the imagination could show the way forward. Um, with Dorothea Lang, much more is written about her. But again, there was this one relationship that had not been written about. It occupied one paragraph in Dorothea Lange's excellent five or 600 page biography, recent biography by Linda Gordon. And, um, and so in that case, um, I wasn't able to find material about the specific woman, but I was able to find accounts of Chinese women during that era, um, the, uh, the history of San Francisco itself, a lot of clues were, um, I mean, one very important clue was that she had, this woman had grown up in a mission home. So I was able to delve into the history of the mission, um, a mission in San Francisco that rescued Chinese uh, girls from uh, these notorious gambling and uh, houses of prostitution. So again, you're sort of like trying as much as you can to amass. And then uh, it, it comes, there comes a point where you realize again, that the imagination is the only way forward. Mm -hmm. Nasrin, please. Um, yes, uh, thank you so much, Jasmine. I really enjoyed hearing you. And as Aida mentioned, was truly captivating. Um, so as you mentioned about Furuq, I found this that many um, Iranian artists, I noticed after the revolution, they chose to stay in Iran because their identity was so tied 
to the country. And it's like, even though it was suffocating for them, but it was also their airway. So, and they uh, were responsible, they felt to speak the truth for the voiceless. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate uh, hearing you mentioning this about uh, Farouk. Um, my other question, um, well, that was my comment, but also uh, when you um, came up with the idea of writing the book uh, about, you, you found out about your mother's uh, secret, uh, I guess you're, I'm imagining that uh, you felt that you're in the position to speak the, your mother's truth and I'm wondering how was your, <laughs> did it take a lot of <laughs> convincing um, because, you know, as you mentioned that for us, for different reasons, for Iranian women, it's so hard for us uh, to express uh, the 100% of truth because due to political, cultural uh, censorship. So uh, how did that go? Did it take a lot of convincing uh, for, your, for you? <laughs> to, yeah. To, yeah. So I was looking at the clock. How much time do we have? <laughs> because we have like, time. Don't worry. <laughs> For a long time about this um yeah, and no that book came out 10 years ago so i have ha i have a lot of perspective now you know and my answer to this question is far more i mean it, it's a lot i could be a lot more honest now 10 11 years on um and partially because my mother now has advanced alzheimer's and um you know in a sense that has given me complete authorship over our story her story right but at the time that i was writing the book um, this is in uh, 2008 or so, I had started writing personal essays and my mother saw me angling in, in the direction of her life. Um, one of my neighbors is on this call, so she might remember this era in our lives, but I was in a creative writing workshop at Book Passage and I was writing these personal essays, nothing about my mother, not about the secret, not that, you know, but um, my mother saw that I was headed in that direction. And I kid you not, it's, I will never forget. I was sitting in a creative writing workshop and I saw like my mother, like a shark, you know, I saw her coming at me, <laughs> you know, I saw her head over the book stacks, you know, and she actually came to the workshop um, because she had seen some writings of mine that she thought had to do with her. They actually didn't, but um, it was enough. And she made a, she just came right at me at the workshop itself, <laughs> didn't decide to wait. Um, and, and, what she said and continued to say for many years is, you have no right. This is not your story. You have no right to tell the story. Um, now, as I became a better writer, um, and I backed off, I didn't, I, I didn't do it. So, but as I became a, a better writer, you know, I think it surprised my mother a little bit. And she was surprised that Americans would be interested in our little Iranian stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she kind of, you know, assessed me and she thought, well, if I tell her the story now, if I cooperate and let her publish this book while I'm alive, now I'm, I'm imagining this, all right? Mm -hmm. While I am alive, I will be able to control this story in a way that I will not be able to control it when she inevitably gets to writing this story because I, could, I, could, I know my daughter and I know she's gonna do it at some point. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, that's how I think, that's how I think the thinking process went. And so um, we collaborated, but that wasn't still not the end of the story. Um, there were many drafts of the story and she, she wanted to see them. She um, you know, really felt like she had the right to, to have, it, have it be told as she wanted it to. Um, there was a moment now in publishing, there's something called an advanced reader's copy, an ARC. Mm -hmm. And this is when your book is, it's about to be published, there's no, there's no stopping the presses at this point. I was sent a copy of this. I gave it to my mother. It was the first time that she was seeing the book in its entirety. All right. So I had managed to kind of show her parts of it, but not all of it. And she came to, again, like <laughs> she came to my house in this instant instance, and she tore that book page by page by page. You know, how dare you? How dare you? Um, and so I had to work really hard to convince her um i i prevailed in most in most instances i did um in in farsi we have this word siyasat like yes. diplomacy like i had to use such clever diplomacy basically i had to appeal to her pride <laughs> i had to convince her that telling the truth 
made her more noble, that, that having the full version of her family story made them more heroic. I mean, I really should go into international diplomacy or something from this. <laughs> <laughs> it's extraordinary, but the but the parts that she objected to most, honest, uh, truly, um, apart for, from certain things related to her father and how I portrayed the domestic uh, abuse against my grandmother, apart from that, the thing that really incensed her was my my revelation of our relationship in the more current day. You know, she was appalled that I was letting people know our dirty laundry. You know. She, she, there were, there were certain things, I mean, that I was saying in that book that she just thought it was a betrayal for me to be telling these things. Um, and in the end, I just, I essentially told her that I have sovereignty over those parts, the parts that you lived. Okay, let's talk about it. But the parts that are true, having said all this, this is a very long explanation, but if I wrote the book now, in some ways, well, I couldn't because she has Alzheimer's and so she could not tell me the story anymore. I could be far more honest though. Um, and there are parts of the story that I am just beginning to, to, to tell myself even, you know? And so I write personal essays sometimes. I mean, if I feel called to, but in the end, that's why I write fiction is because <laughs> This whole experience, I, I, it was a bless, the blessing of my life. That book made me into a writer. If I could survive this experience, I mean, writing a novel has been far, far less complicated emotionally. Um, but now I choose to write fiction and I tell the truth. The funny thing is when you write a memoir, people say, oh, how much did you make up? And when you write, um, <laughs> when you write a novel, um, they say how much of it is your own life, you know, so you can never entirely be free, but I find I can just, I, I have so much more uh, liberty now in, in writing fiction, and I'm so grateful that that's available to me because I could not write more nonfiction. I, I just, it's, it's awfully hard. Um, I marvel that I did it once. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine, uh, and Mona asked uh, Dr. Darznik, do you think uh, your stories would be different in your, uh, if you wrote them um, in your home country of Iran? How would you they, write them? They would not be possible. I mean, I would be, I, if I wrote them, then I would hide them in a cupboard. I mean, how many thousands of extraordinary stories are hidden in some chest or bureau or basement in Iran, you know, um, certainly nonfiction, it would be impossible. Um, mm. If I was in Iran, uh, I might turn to poetry that has been a way that Iranian writers because poetry allows for more subtlety and more subversion in a certain way, you know, mm. you don't have to be direct, maybe I would have turned to poetry. Um, I just don't, I cannot imagine a writer's life in Iran, you know, that, that it's unfathomable to me that I could be writing what I, what I do um, in Iran itself. Yeah, going through that, I'd like to show this. This is a Farooq's, uh, just collection of poems. Uh, as you see, this is, this looks like an unfinished, very cheap new uh, cover because these are the uncensored uh, version of her poems after revolution. I bought it you know, from black market in Iran you know, almost 30 years ago. So this is the one. And then after revolution, they, for a while, as you mentioned, they just stopped uh, publishing her uh, poems. Then when they, a little bit the political um, atmosphere was open, they started to censor it. And then the censored ones, would just be published. And mm -hmm. this uh, versions was uh, an underground publishing mm -hmm. uh, versions of the books. Yeah. And uh, speaking of um, uh, poetry, you would go to poetry. I'd like to, we have one more comment, which I would like to, if you uh, let me, I just want to ask you to give me the permit to share one of the Farooq's um, poems. It's very short. 
I'm mm -hmm. sure it's very political and it applies to all times ever. Uh, first, I'm going to read it in English and then uh, the Farsi so you can, uh, uh, our uh, guests would just find out how beautifully and then melodic uh, her poems uh, are. It says, the gift is the title of the um, poem. I speak from the deep end of night, of end of darkest I speak. I, I speak of deep night ending. Oh, kind friend, if you visit me, my house, bring me a lamp, cut me a window, so I can gaze at the swarming alley of the fortunate. Uh, this is one of her uh, poems says, uh, which talks about the darkness. Man az nahayat shab harf mizanam. Man az nahayat tariki va az nahayat shab harf mizanam. Agar be khane ye man omadi ye mehraban baraye man chirag biyavar. Va yek dariche ke az an be izdaham huche ye khushbakht bengaram. This is one of her poems which I'd like to share when you said no you would go to poetry so it's so <laughs> it's so political so social cultural and then I see a lot of things in it of course she's yeah. one of my favorites so, yeah yeah, in it. yeah. It's extraordinary yeah yeah and then uh Pan I'm gonna read this and then maybe uh, what stories do you think are missing from uh, history how do how do we tell them if they are missing. How do we tell them if they are missing? Okay, um, so many stories. I, I I said in particular stories about women, um, stories about people of color. Absolutely, and just to give you the the two to me glaring um, absences in in our literature. Um, how do you tell them? Well. <laughs> Fiction is one avenue, um, but I think also some something that's available probably to all of us is to sit with our family members, you know, so if you're from an immigrant background, or even if you're not, I've got Sarah's um, is my one of my students and my beloved student, and um, she's interested in her family, her ancestors in uh, Kentucky who came up to, you know, and I, and I know that she's sat down with aunts, you know, that the, the, the gathering of the story has been an occasion for her to connect with her family again and no historian or you know no other person can do that work only Sarah can do that work and I think all of us probably we have access to someone with a story that might otherwise be lost unless we put ourselves in service to it so that is what that is one recommendation I would give is is if you're really if you feel an urgency, if you feel a calling to tell stories that are hidden, unseen, not recoverable through any other means, look around in your life, you know, who could you sit with and really listen, you know, um, I bet that there's an extraordinary story there. Yeah, thank you so much. You may check the uh, comments, please, the chat box, because many of our colleagues and friends just wrote some uh, words for you. Uh, okay, I'll, I will. <laughs> I'm getting distracted. I want to. I want to spend every moment with you all. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Though I know we're uh, we are at we're past six thirty and yeah. um, just six minutes. And I, you know, and I'm happy to chat with anybody if you want to hang out for a moment. There was something you didn't ask, but thank you so much for this chance to speak with you. I wish it was in person. I hope it's not the last time <laughs> we're all in the Bay Area. So yeah. I'd love to, um, I would love yeah. to cross paths again. Yeah, thank you so much for this amazing speech and thanks for uh, accepting my invitation to be our guest tonight. Uh, uh, students, you know, I'd like you to write your names, your classes and your professor's names in the chat box. And I thank all our guests and thank you again. Uh, actually, pre in pre-pandemic days, we had uh, these talks on campus, but uh, after the pandemic, so we are having it online on uh, Zoom. Uh, hopefully one day we'll just have this on campus as well. 
Thank you so much. And uh, if any words you want to share as a last thing, Jasmine? Corbonnet, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, thanks for uh, participating. Have a good evening.